everybody, guess what? Today is episode 300, and I didn't plan it this way, but it's also my seven-year anniversary. Me doing this every week for seven years. So, hey, Demi, um, I'm so excited, and Kim, and Carrie, and all these people, thank you for coming for today. Um, anyway, I'm so excited to be doing episode 300. Jeremy is such an influence to me and is such an inspiration. And when you, like normally that's how he was. And then he told me another side of the story and I was like, so I can't wait. It really is. Like, I'm so excited to share more about Jeremy because like he's just rocking it. And then you hear this other layer of story. And I just think it's really for us who are, cranking and we're trying to we're working and we're either working a full-time job and doing a side hustle or we have gone out full-time we're going to talk about the other f word and it's called what jeremy am i allowed to say this on your (laughs) my mom's not here yet okay freelance oh i know (laughs) thank goodness my mom wasn't there but so we're going to dig into why you, I don't know if you hate the word freelance, but you do kind of cringe when we say it, when people yes, say it. I do. Yeah. Well, most, sometimes, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad, but I hear a lot of times not used right. So, okay. So, so let's just dig into that and then we're going to get into your backstory, but why, okay. why freelance? Why is that about? And thank you guys for making 300 episodes and some of you guys have come every week and I just am so, so, so thankful. And I'm just so thankful to have so many friends and Derek's here and all, I mean, Amber's here. Anyway, just thank you and thank, come back and hit like if you're watching on YouTube because <laughs> you're not here live yeah. or something. Okay, Jeremy, why do you hate the word freelance? Well, before we get started, I just want to say way to go on seven years and 300 episodes. That is a huge deal. So, and I just want to say I'm super honored to be able to be on, on today. So thank you so much for that. Um, so freelance, I think here's where I don't, I, I like the word freelance. I've been a freelancer. I know many freelancers and freelance is good. There's nothing wrong with freelance. The biggest issue I have is like when I go to Creative South or I go to a conference or I'm hanging out with other designers and when I, when they introduce themselves to me, the first thing they say is I'm a freelance whatever. I'm a freelance photographer. I'm a freelance designer, a uh, freelance illustrator, whatever it happens to be. But then I find out that they actually work with their own clients. Mm. They actually uh, are managing their own projects and, um, and they are like doing long-term and long-term like engagement with a project on a, with a client. And to me, uh, I categorize the word freelancers under two different categories. One is moonlighters mm-hmm. um, and moonlighters. And you know, I'm going to forget what the other one is. It's in my, it's in my, uh, my blog post. Um, but, but moonlighters are basically people who they work in the evenings, work on the weekends. They've got a full-time job and they're kind of like doing this uh, project uh, like on the side. They do it as for extra income on the side um, and, and, and that's great. Like you need that extra money to take that family vacation or, or whatever. And, and that's fine, but they're not available during the day. They're not available to their clients to, uh, to have like a full service project product to deliver to them or, or process they go through. And then the other one is nomads and nomads. And I've been both of these at different times in my career. A nomad is someone who basically sets up shop and works in house for an agency for a little bit. And then like on a temporary contract and then, you know, a few months later, they, they're somewhere else and they're working with them on a short-term contract. And so those are great and everything. But if you don't fit those two categories, um, you're actually a small business because, um, you know, you're not working through another agency. You're not working uh, on behalf of someone else. To me, you are a self-contained creative business at that point in time. Um, And the problem with using the word freelance is, is that people that happen to do moonlighting um, or happen to even do uh, at times, even people that do nomad stuff, they're all worked on an hourly basis, almost always. And, uh, and they do it, um, they do it at a discounted rate. And so there's an understanding that freelance kind of means cheap. 
And if you're your own business, if you're, then you're actually competing against agencies. So price yourself as if you're competing against agency. agency. Yeah. Right. So one of the things, and I think me and you talked about this last time, whenever, I don't know, one of the times we talked, we talked randomly on the phone too. So, but freelance, did you guys know that freelance really came from people jousting? And so it would be people who would joust for either team. If you could pay them enough, they would joust for you. They would do be a stand in. So it's a Lance that would, was a free agent sort of in a way, right? Right. So yeah. Doc says fun Lancer. He's a fun Lancer. So maybe he's doing things that he wants to do for fun. But I, one thing I love is that you're really talking about it being a business. There's like a piece of grubby something on my glasses. That's why I don't have them on right this second. And I'm really trying to get it off. So, um, but for, but it really like hit me when we started talking about this, I was like, Oh, and I do say I'm a business owner, but then I also use the word freelancer. So I also think somebody in the chat said um, somebody who's a part, maybe it's Demi. He said it was somebody part of another team. And I think sometimes a freelancer is, that's me, a contractor that they're trying to hire. They have to hire in to get one job finished it, because it's not a consistent, you're not going to consistently be with the client. You may have no c client facing um, time, right? Right. If you, if you, if you are working where you are full time under your own LLC and it, the, the problem, that's great. Sorry. He, they didn't see it. Just you. I'm, I had to lick my glasses, people. I'm so sorry. Diane so just, only Jeremy saw it. Just licked her glasses like a, what are those, uh, what are the, uh, like a chameleon or something. I don't know what it was. Or a or like, giraffe. A giraffe. Oh, that's what it was. now they're clean. Okay. So sorry. I'm so sorry. I can't even see that. Um, so, uh, a free, a freelancer, uh, is in so many, so many times when I hear people say they're freelancers, I feel like it's a mindset and I feel like they are, they are looking at projects as a, an hourly commodity rather than a partnership relationship mm -hmm. as a business to a business. And, um, and I think that when you see, the way you see yourself, uh, oftentimes is how you work. And so if you see yourself as a freelancer, but you're not one, but you behave like one, then you're going to confuse clients. Yeah. So, but, I, but it's about that relationship and it's about, right. it, it's like, you're just a stand in for a date. Like, Oh, well, I'll dance with you on this card. But right. that's not most of us. That's not what we're trying to do. We're actually trying to have, a relationship with the person that we're dancing with. Right. 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 Yep. I like anyway, that. I love, I love that you're so passionate about it. So I think maybe some of us need to adjust how, what we're calling ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think part of it is, is people that consider themselves freelancers typically, like I said, they don't charge enough. Um, and, and it, what it does is if you are competing at freelancer rates, but as an agency, then you're driving down the market value in your community of what you're offering people. Okay, um, so, so this is a huge problem for most people and we're just digging in. So how did you, okay, let's give them a little bit of the backstory. So mm -hmm. you're like killing it in high school, which I think, so Fred's 16, killing it in high school. That's why you, I wanted you and Fred to get connected. I yeah. send you both an email. Um, but so you're doing your mascot, you're doing all kinds, um, all kinds of things. And, and you start, tell us what high school was like and, and how you started getting in. Yeah. So, uh, high school was uh, school in general. Normally, was horrible. you know, we do not talk about people's high school experiences. So this is like, again, we're going way back. Like dinosaurs are roaming the earth. <laughs> this is. This is, we're talking 1980s folks uh, and, and you early graduated 90s. when? 1993 from high school. And I'm 91, so. There you go. Okay. Okay. So, um, and I'm old for my class. I was held back, so. Um, no, you were red-shirted. That's what we call it. There you go. Whatever you want to call it. I don't, <laughs> I don't care. Uh, but I, uh, I was one of the older ones in my, older kids in my class. But I never fit in in school. I. ADD. I have some dyslexia issues. 
Um, and it, I was ADD before anyone knew what ADD was. And finally, right about the time I got into high school, people started diagnosing it um, and I got some help. And so high school ended up being better for me than the rest. But um, school in general for me was horrible. It was the worst years of my life. Um, mm. But the cool thing was, is that uh, I always had really great art teachers, really great art classes, um, great art teachers and in schools that prioritize the arts. And so that was something that was really great. And it was my superpower. Um, and the art room was, was like my, what's, what's Superman call his, his place, his, uh, uh, someone's going to come up with it on the chat. What's Superman's place? It's made of crystals. No, no. Yes. Uh, it's fortress, fortress of, of solitude. Earth. Oh, do you have your chat yeah. back open? No, but I have the little, it pops up whenever someone says something. I can't see the oh. whole thing, but whatever, someone pops oh. up. I was so like... the Fortress of Solitude. Yeah, nope, can't do that. Um, uh, and so when I had any spare minute, any spare time, I was in the art room. And I do a lot of work with education still today. If I'm on a, uh, on a high school or even a college campus uh, doing photography or working on a design project or identity for them, when I walk into an art classroom, I just feel like, I just like, oh, there's something about the smell of paint. There's something about mm. the fact that nothing matters in here except that you can create stuff. That just always resonated with me. So I was an art nerd. I was a theater nerd. Um, I did, I took every opportunity I could to design and draw and create stuff. So whenever we had a, a new play, I would do the play t-shirts and then we would make the posters that would go around school. Um, my youth pastor, um, I lived in San Diego for a while growing up and we just had summers full of activities and he, he knew that I struggled in school and he knew that I just kind of struggled a little bit socially. Um, and so during the summers he would roll out these giant rolls of butcher paper that were like 15 feet long and like three or four feet wide and give me these big old giant markers that are like marker brushes that are like this big. And I would, and I would create the things that would have all the fun activities and we'd put them all the way around the youth room. And I would just walk in there and I was like, I knew I wasn't one of the cool kids. And I knew that, um, that I struggled a lot, but walking in there and going, I did that. I did that. I did that. That just, it was, it was kind of like the thing I could own. I wasn't great at sports. I wasn't great academically. I barely graduated high school because I failed algebra two uh, and, and then almost failed it again my senior year. Um, but, um, but the thing that got me through was being able to, to art, do art. And I went to a small but school. But not just so do art, like succeed. And you had success right. in this. This was yeah. other people, businesses were coming to you. This was not just, uh, oh, Jeremy's high good at school. art. Yeah. Right. In high school, I was doing a few things like that. Um, I did my, uh, our, our high school mascot was horrible. So I redrew it, drew that my senior year. Um, and now I literally last week, I just, I just worked with my old high school 25 years later to, to rebrand them. And it's, it's, it's got aspects of that warrior that I created my senior year in it. So, um, it, which has been really cool. And both my kids go to that school now, which is Kyle cool. Courtright went to that school. Yes, Kyle Courtright went to that school. That's right. My dad was the basketball coach there for many years and was in administration. Fantastic school. Love it. Um, so then but, what happens after high school? So you barely so, graduate because of that stupid yeah. algebra class. Yes. And then, and D is saying, this feels like you're talking about me. I'm seeing a pattern of creatives in high school. It sucks to be honest. Oh, yeah. You feel so oh, bad yeah. for Fred who's 16 in uh, Belgium, who totally sounds like an American, to be honest. I was like, where are you? Yeah, in but the place? waffles. What? He's in Belgium. The wa they, at least he's got the waffles going. Oh, on, right? I, I'm thinking Mark, I you know, know, with the Mark Hyron with the waffle, creative waffles. Right. So it just yeah. the whole waffle thing throws me off. That's okay. Right. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, um, I, uh, I was going to go to a, a local design school in Dayton, not too far from here, about two hours from here. It's called School of Advertising Art. They just changed them, their name to the modern. I love that school. Uh, and I, um, I was, I was enrolled. I was going. Um, I took a year. I had to pay for my own college. So I went to a year at the local um, community college on my own dime. And while I was there, I was like working at a bakery and I was kneading bread in the mornings and going to work there in the evenings. 
And my dad was looking through the Columbus Dispatch. We used to have these things called newspapers back then, right? <laughs> and in them, they had these things called want ads where they would put like list jobs and stuff. And one of the things was, is that there was a local t-shirt company that was looking to hire a designer. And I had, because of all my the stuff I've been doing in high school, learned how to prep files for separations and overprinting and trapping and all that stuff. And I knew it uh, and, and half tones and all that. So I, it didn't say anything about needing a college degree and doing that would have been way better than working at the bakery. I thought I could get a summer's worth of experience, went in, applied and got the job over a bunch of college graduates. Um, they didn't even ask me. So got that job, worked on it all that summer and just learned insane amounts like on the job with a really, really, really great mentor who's a friend of mine, ended up being a groomsman in my wedding, um, just awesome guy named Darren, and um, ended up shooting their catalog, laying out, learning Quark Express, and designing the layout. Like, it just, like, I grew so much that summer. Okay, so I want you to respond to this. Fred is 16. He's, yes. um, ha, I just sometimes want to get school over with. I am ready. I know what I want to do. And school is just stopping me in a sense. I have learned so much from school, but feel like I'm ready now to branch off. Any tips to overcome this? Or should I just suck it up and suffer for the last two years left? You know what I told him? I was like, you need to think of everything like a project, everything like a client project. Because there are projects that we don't always necessarily like. So spin it. He had to do like a paper on like uh, feminism or something. I can't remember exactly. T put it in the chat. But I was like, oh, pretend like this is a client. You're doing a, a brochure for him. How could you make this better? And uh, yeah. I mean, because sometimes there's a uh, feminism article it was. So what would you, what would you do, tell him to do? Uh, draw, keep, allow art and drawing and design to be the thing that gets you through high school. I don't know if schools go the same way there that they do in the States, but get through high school for sure. Um, and, uh, and then see what God has for you at that point. Like I am, I am a firm, I love college. Uh, but I, but I don't know that it's necessarily for everybody. Um, and that's basically what happened for me is that I basically just finished, uh, I finished high school I went to a year at community college, completely planning on going to design school, got this job at the end of the summer. The guy that had hired me and was kind of my mentor at that point said, look, I just want you to know you've been so awesome here. You've grown so much. You've surpassed me in many ways. And he's like, you know, you need to go off and that's what God has for you this summer. Go for it. Right. Um, but it, but if you have, um, if, if you want to uh, stay on your, you have a job here. So I called the school. And I asked them if my scholarship would, would roll over to the following year, if they would extend it. And they said, yes. So I'm like, what's, why not? I've got a job. I'm getting paid to do it. I'm growing like crazy. Um, my skills are getting better and better. And I've got a good mentor who's pouring into me. So I stayed for another year. And it grew and grew and grew and grew. Um, and then next thing you know, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting a job uh, offer from an interactive agency, a vid video and film and interactive agency. I ended up working there. We designed Abercrombie and Fitch's first web page. This is like when the internet was just starting. Um, did a lot of work with Warner Alliance Records out of Nashville. Um, worked with uh, with people like, uh, with especially in the Christian community. Worked with like the Newsboys and worked with Cademan's Call and got nominated for a Dove Award and it was really really cool. And then I've had a chance to work in print and all sorts of different agencies. And then in 1998, uh, a friend of mine and I started a agency just the two of us okay so, so, so never went to co never went to design school i don't have any oh, go ahead. yeah i don't have it i don't have any formal design education but man you're killing it have you people seen his work i don't know if you want me to pull up your instagram oh man i totally forgot to say hey this is brought to you by instagram i mean not instagram <laughs> Wow. It's brought to you by Audible. You can get a free book at audibletrial.com slash design recharge. I'm so bad at sponsorships. Thank God they're not sponsored. They're just affiliates, people. So I get a piece of the pie. Um, and full disclosure, I'm horrible at social media. So my Instagram, follow me, but you're not going to get much because I don't, I hate social media. So like, if you really want to see my work, go to my website. Um, but do, do follow me, follow me on Twitter and all the, the, the things, but um, I'm not super active on it. I don't have time for one okay. thing. 
So, so I'm going to just plop your thing. So it's Slagle Design, which is your last name. And yes. this is not the thing you started with your friend in 98. But one of the mm. things we talked started talking in the very beginning, and I'll put your Instagram, it's Slagle Design on um, Instagram. But so one of the things that you talked about was pricing. So we started this conversation out as a pricing. So when you are a freelancer, you tend to price yourself less. When you're a design firm, you price yourself more. Was this, at this point, you were probably doing much freelance, but do you think at this point you were pricing, if you were doing any, you were pricing yourself as a freelancer or how did you learn to start pricing things on based on value to the client instead of, because this is a really hard hurdle. This is a hard hurdle for me right now. Yeah, that's a great question. I think we started out, we used like the Graphic Artist Guild uh, to kind of build our first contract. We we did a lot of like, uh, I think How Design and other, th there's been multiple publications that used to kind of say, here's kind of the average of what something like this costs, kind of start a form a base for it. But honestly, um, we started to figure out like at what what price point are we getting work and at what price point are we losing jobs? Um, and to a certain extent, it was trial and error, but we've always, always, always uh, quoted projects by, uh, by, the pro by, the product, by the project. I almost never, ever even keep track of my time on projects. I don't right. log. But, but it's figuring out what the value is to that client. Right. And somehow reverse right. engineering and then knowing, right. like when you're starting out, you and your friend in 1998, you're like, okay, well, we've been pricing this for a logo or we've been pricing this for a, a magazine or annual report or whatever. Right. You know, you might do it and that might be good money at that point, but it's right. not good money. And it, like you're saying, it is degrading the industry because the price is too low, right? right? Yeah. And I think most people start out and there's nothing wrong with this, but I think most people start out more hungry for work and there's a little bit of a scarcity mentality. So you tend to price price stuff lower than you think to, to get the job. I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with that. I've, there have been many, many times when I've gotten a project or won a bid on a project and I've been twice as much as the next bid and it, well, it didn't come down to price. It came down to experience. portfolio and experience, mm -hmm. right? So I do think that to a certain extent, it's, you, you have some major hurdles to overcome with a new agency that has no reputation. So you're gonna have to, you're gonna have, to have your bar a little lower going into those projects in order to get, to get some traction. And the other thing is when I've been learning something new, so I, <laughs> this really takes it back, but I learned, I t so I, ugh, sorry, here's what it is. I have, I have a master's degree in graphic design. I've never studied anything else and I still have imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are. I think unless you're just super cocky and bad, then you don't have imposter syndrome. So some people I think have it worse. I think, um, and I, I hate that for those people, including me at times. But here's the thing. We have to always be teaching ourselves new things. Our industry is what I love about it but it's always changing. So nobody taught me web. There was no web design when I was in right. school. So right. I there were no websites when I was in school. There was not email when I was in school. Right. Well, right. I don't think we had email at Auburn. Email came right around, right around that 99, 1993, 1994 time, right in there. Yeah. Right. Where, where people actually started getting the free AOL CDs in the mail. Totally. I never did AOL, but my husband did. Um, but so I taught myself web design and I call myself a web designer. So why do I not have imposter syndrome? I do in some, to some extent about that, but I think, well, I'm a web designer to a point. I, I can do it to a point. And I think that that's okay. It's kind of like, mm -hmm. oh, well, you know, I can use this tool. I can use this screwdriver to a point, but boy, you give me a power drill and I could really go crazy building a house. I just think it's sometimes it's about the tools and sometimes it's about how you utilize the tool. All you can make, all you could do is just make, you know, 
benches. But if you have this tool, this power drill, and you have an imagination, you can do whatever. And nobody gives you that imagination. I think that there's benefits. Obviously, I teach at a university. So I think that there's benefits of going to a university. But I don't think everybody needs, now I do have some of my students in here, so I'm so sorry if you disagree. But I do think some of you could do this on your own. It's not, um, but you have to be willing. So here's one of the things that gets in my craw a little bit, Jeremy, when people will be like, oh, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to, I've been doing print for 10 years. Now I want to do UX UI or I want to do web. Right. Okay. But then they want the same salary that they have as a print designer. You can't, yeah. right? No. You have to, no. you, there's a learning. So whenever I've taken a client job, that's something I don't know. I have to do this at a, uh, lower price because I'm learning. I don't know if that's necessarily bad, but I do think I'm so glad I've done this because I feel bad about some of the things that I've learned. You know what I mean? Do you? Yeah. Well, so, so I think a good, a, another good example of that is like we do, we focus on branding. We do logos, we do identity, and then we do extension of that. So packaging or website, whatever. And so we love Squarespace. We do a lot of stuff with Squarespace, but Squarespace has its limitations, right? Um, if, if you need to have a client that has, is able to create like a log, a login, and then they have to create like, uh, uh, you know, be able to set up their own content or whatever. And there's a lot of things that Squarespace that I cannot do, they can't handle. Um, in which case we have partners that we, that we bring in that are developers to do that stuff. So to me, it's about knowing knowing your boundary and sometimes it's about coming up to it and figuring out the hard way because you overcommitted on something and now you're mm. spending 20 times more time on it than you expected and you, you just have to realize like i'm never doing that again like i learned my lesson not doing that again don't offer that i'm going to find someone else to do that for me Bye. so we do photography but even with that like if if i had a, a client hire me and say we need a fashion shoot where we need to get a model agency involved we need to get like uh we need to get uh, makeup and hair and wardrobe and all that stuff. I'm going to hire someone who knows how to do that. I do a lot of candid photography on site. Uh, you know, more, more of that type of thing. Um, I do some studio work, but, um, but it's mostly like tabletop type stuff. So I, I know where, I know where my lane is on that. And then I just, you know, with illustration, like if somebody called me and said, Hey, I want you to do an illustration like Andy, Andy J. Miller, you know, or someone else, I'd be like, well, call Andy J. Miller. I'm not going to do that. That's not my thing. Right. Could I, could I do something that looks like his stuff? Yes, but I won't because I, that's just not my thing and I'm not good at it. I, I, I would botch it and right. Andy would, and I'd get a call from Andy the next day. So Andy, we're friends. So he'd be allowed to call me and give me a hard time about that. Well, that's good then. Yeah. But I think it is. I think you have to know where your lane is. I think as we're right. really early, I've had, I have this new way of helping people and I don't think it really works for me yet because I think it's hard to do it on yourself, but a new way to figure out what, what lane they need to be in. And I think that we're really clear on some things. I'll share that with y'all on another thing. Okay. Back to you, Jeremy. Do you ever deal with imposter syndrome? You, I saw that question in the, um, I, I think imposter syndrome means different things to different people in some ways. Um, and I think I have felt it, but usually I feel imposter syndrome when I've stepped out of that boundary. Usually so, I, I, I would say when it comes to just doing illustration and brand work, I don't. When I step out of that, when I step out of the zone in which my skill set ends, mm -hmm. Uh, then I will, I, I, I realize I'm in over my head and then I definitely feel imposter syndrome. I feel like I'm telling a client that I can do something that I can't. Mm. Okay. So I'm, I'm showing them your Instagram right now, just so that we can get some ideas. You have lots of, yeah, see, I'm one of those horrible people. Like, like I've got my photos from Cambodia trips on here. Like my Instagram has, is like family stuff mixed with so like i said instagram horrible some of the stuff's like yeah i was old. trying to find um the one of the ones there's dylan um yep. but like this one the woolly pig is awesome this yep. brand is and it's very different you know that you have a different but again that's because you're good at branding 
this packaging. Great. Absolutely. Um, but I was trying to think, um, there was one you sent me and I'll have to go back and find it, but, um, I'll find it in just a second. Let me stop. There's my son and I at creative South this year, that top oh. one there. We were, oh. we dressed, dressed up for the uh, cosplay night. That was a blast. Oh, nice. I thought that was real people. I mean, like, no, that was me and Kayla. I see. My, now. Uh, my high school son went with me to creative South this year. It was a blast. Yes. Okay. So, so, um, sometimes I deal with it when I'm trying something new and then I'm trying to do it. And so, or I'm like, oh my goodness, why am I talking about this? I'm just learning it myself. Or I feel kind of like, a, um, like I shouldn't be sharing this, but my friend Chris Doe will say, you just teach what you're learning right now because it's, that's top of mind. It's, it's, um, really good where you are. Um, all right. So you didn't take the typical route. So tell them a little bit, give them a little bit, like a five minute, um, about what happened from 1998 till 10 years ago is when you went on, on your own. Yeah. Yes. Yep. This is my 10th year. Because what I think is interesting is that you did this as a partnership with somebody else. Um, uh, maybe not exact partnership on owning the business, but um, this was kind of a, a way for you to ease in and you could do it together. You could learn right. together and really hone on each other's strengths, but yes. then you also um, get to figure out who you wanted to work for. Because at that point, 1998, did you know what kind of clients you wanted to work for? No, we took anything and everything. And honestly, even today, I'm kind of a catch all, which I don't mind. I love the fact that sometimes I'm working on food and beverage or a restaurant. And then the next day I'm working on a mascot for a college in Seattle. Like, I love that. I love that um, I have the ability to, it, I'm never bored to say the least. Um, but yeah, so John and I, uh, John uh, is about five years older than me. And um, he, he was a big mentor for me as well. Like when I was in high school and I wanted to, and I first started getting into graphic design. He was the one that basically said, Hey, I've got a computer, come over and learn it. And he taught me a lot of the software ahead of time. So fast forward a few years, he's married. He went off to Detroit for a little bit, got a job as a designer. And he actually doesn't have a degree in design either. He's an English major from Ohio state. Um, moved back to Ohio and we started this company and, um, it was great. Um, but one of the things that became really clear for John was, that uh, graphic design wasn't really like doing it for him quite as much. And he took a mission trip to Cambodia. Like personally, it personally. was not feeding him because I think at some point when you're, when you're shelter, food, those things, when those aren't being met, it becomes the, the business becomes about something else. Right. 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 So he took a back right around 2000 or 2001. He took a, a short term, trip with a friend to Cambodia. Uh, and really he has three adopted children from Asia. One's Chinese, uh, one's Vietnamese and one's Korean. And so he already has a heart for, for kids, international kids. And while he was over there, he just like realized that the corruption and the problems that Cambodia had with, uh, child poverty and, and children on the street was a, a major issue. And that, uh, the government run, um, uh, facilities were just horrible the orphanages so he came back home kind of figured out like what are we going to do about this and then got a couple people together and they opened a home and housed about 20 kids in it and uh and thought yeah this is great and then someone else came along and said hey we'd like to do one of those what do you think about doing a second home and then a third home and then this this church model came out of it and um so by the time 2009 came around which is about 11 or 12 years later um our little agency we had uh, i think there were four employees was john and i and four other people um we were also operating 16 orphanages out of that we had basically our design firm had become a front for orphan care in southeast asia so um, just so you know raxa who's in dc um he said woot from the one cambodian guy here but pray for my country thanks for giving awareness jeremy so awesome i love cambodia i have been four times um, I have such a heart for them. I have so many friends there. Um, I love the people. The people are amazing. The country is amazing. I love Cambodia. If you ever get a chance to go, uh, I've, it's one of my favorite places in the world to go. So 
um, Akun. Uh, and so I, um, I really, really love it. And so, um, so it became this front for orphan. Yeah. Right? And John was like speaking at conferences and he had a board in Canada and he was bringing in churches in Australia that were getting involved. And it just, it, he, he was spending his entire summers with his family in Cambodia. So we got to a point where it just November, 2009, uh, kind of a perfect storm sort of thing, but it was clearly God. Um, and it, we basically, uh, dissolved the agency. Um, and the big blessing that came out of it for me was, is, and it goes back to what you were saying earlier. When we first started, we had very low overhead. It was just John and I in a rented dilapidated office space. Um, that was that, that we had such low overhead that we could do projects with startups and entrepreneurs that didn't have a huge budget. Um, and those were my favorite projects. But by the time 2000, uh, by the time 2009 came around, we had, you know, office space on high street. We had all these people and paying all their benefits and like all this stuff. We were at a point where we couldn't, we were priced, we had priced ourselves out of being able to work with those people again. So I made a real intentional decision at that point to just really scale back. So I'm actually working from my house. Um, but you're on your laptop and you can take us around and you worked yeah. from your house in your bedroom or something. For four years. For four years, which a client told you, Jeremy, it's a little awkward, right? Yeah, yeah, I had a client tell me, uh, you know, I, actually it was a, a writing partner of mine who would met me here. I usually met clients uh, like at Starbucks or something like that, or at their office. Um, but yeah, I had a friend who's a trusted friend who's a writer and he would meet me here every once in a while. He's like, I just, he's like, I think it's kind of weird. And I'm like, what? There's a, there's a shower curtain between my bed in here. I don't know why it's <laughs> awkward. But, uh, at that point I started like, okay, I should think about this. So I started looking at office spaces. I'm eight, eight houses off of high street. So if you're familiar with Columbus, Ohio, high street's like the main drag. I'm like, two miles from Ohio State University, just a few miles from the state capitol building, like right on the main drag. And, um, and so I started looking for spaces just like eight houses away from here. And then I realized I was going to get myself in trouble again because I was going to start ratcheting up my overhead, mm -hmm. which means I wasn't going to be able to work with people I wanted to. So I can, do you mean to show you my yeah. workspace? Yeah, let's yes. show. And so as you're going, taking us on this tour, you decided to take, I guess, maybe a second mortgage and then add on this part. And so how many, how many square feet is this part of the house? Uh, so my office space is 750 square feet. And then how big is the house? The house is 1400. Okay. So, so and it's separate, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll show you actually. So hopefully my, hopefully Internet? I don't lose step outside. So basically, this is my house. Uh, it's just a little Cape Cod, 1953 Cape Cod. And then I, we built on this addition. So if you, maybe you can see it if I go like this. Um, Thank so goodness it's not raining. Yeah, exactly. it was earlier. So the, the clouds uh, went away for the podcast. So, um, so this, is, this is the addition. That's the house. That's the addition that we put on right there. It's two so stories. Did you, was it a two-story so, before? It's a one and a half story Cape Cod. So if you kind of look at it like this, oh, you yeah. kind of see yeah. So that actually that window at the top, that was my office space. Oh, before. Wow. Okay. So you had to go through the door, through the whole house to get in, in order to get into the house. Before. And so you, you did this addition, which yeah. is a third of the whole size of the, the house. So you have your brand there on the door. Yep. yep. So this is, this is how but you go slow because it's really, you have such cool, like your lamp right there is cool. Did you make that? Yeah, I did. <sighs> yep. There's actually a blog post about it on my site too. It's, uh, I just posted it the other day. So I, I dug this wheel out of the trash. It's a bicycle wheel. So then what's but that I, thing on the, it, that, um, those, no, yeah, those things. What is that? Um, they're old drill. Yeah. That's uh, what I was thinking. Drill. Yeah. So I, I'm, uh, I like finding junk at, uh, flea markets and stuff. I found these, these lockers, uh, uh, on sale somewhere and kind of in integrated those as well. Are they so full? I do a little bit of woodworking. So like I made this bench and a few other pieces in here too. Yeah. Right. They're full of like coats and stuff. Okay. So then keep going. Okay. So then, uh, you, this is my downstairs part of the office. So, so this basically, is where you do meetings. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's like, 
a table here that I built that's kind of uh, where I kind of do my uh, meetings. But most of the time we do our meetings on the couch. So I was like, why do you have bus on the wall? But it's Columbus, I think. Yeah, yeah. Colum- people call it uh, Columbus here. They call it sea bus, which they don't do in Columbus, Georgia, which is kind of weird. But that's yeah. they truncate it here as sea bus. Um, so do a lot of my meetings down here, a lot of my collaboration stuff down here, and then got got a TV with an Apple TV, so I can Wait, do my turn, presentations. Turn yeah the the wall of um, cameras. Yeah. So this is my wall of cameras. Again, I collect junk. Uh, from different, different things, like Jason, garage sales and stuff like that. Jason wants to ask, what's the 70 for? The 70 is my address. So oh. my kid just picked that one out for me. Um, but yeah, there's my Keurig. In oh, case nice. you're caffeinated, yeah. And you have Slagle mugs. I do, yes. Okay, so, so yeah, mugs. Jason Carnes, like, I ha- am a junk man too. Okay, so... Yeah. No, one of the things is you do need air conditioning. And so you decided yep. to do this kind of air conditioning. I saw the one yes. upstairs. So can you tell us about this? Because if somebody's really thinking about this. Yeah. So um, the one option would have been to like tie it into wait, the rest of the. Wait, Go ahead. so Kim Vanilla is like, is Chip and Joanna Gaines going to pop out during this tour? Anyway, That's people hilarious. are loving no this space. Lap. Well, what? thank you. There's no ship lap. No ship okay. lap. Okay. I do love, I love Chip and Joanna as well. Um, so we, um, we basically, uh, to answer your question, what was your question? I'm trying to remember what your question was. I got derailed. Oh, um, uh, mm, I don't know. We're just so loving. Oh, oh, the air conditioning. Oh yeah. Yeah. Air conditioning. So, uh, we could have put, we, we went with these, they're called mini splits. And the nice thing about a mini split is a, they're super efficient. B, Um, we would have had to upgrade the whole furnace and air conditioning for the rest of the house and then run ductwork into here. And so we're like, no, that was relatively new. So we basically, the rest of the house is set up with the regular conventional and then this side. So the, the floor, the floor, the, um, what's the the floor look like? Hardwood. I laid it myself. (gasps) Wow. Jeremy looks awesome. And actually here's one of my most prized employees right here. That's, that's my beast. That's Scout. Hey, Scout. Um, and so uh, we basically, uh, that was one of the things that ways that I save money is the contractors, like it was December 15th and they took two weeks off at Christmas and they basically said, you've got two weeks. Well, you get to install the hardwood floor and, and the stair- spiral staircase. So I, when they left, it was all just drywalled um, and they got out of my way. And I took two weeks. I learned how to lay hardwood floors and I learned how to put in a spiral staircase. And that saved me like $7,000. Yeah. So ended up saving a lot of money by doing some sweat equity. So I've always wanted to have a spiral staircase. So they just basically so, cut the hole up there to mm-hmm. the specs that I needed. And then I installed that over Christmas. So did you have it made by a welder? Yeah, there's, a, there's companies. There's one in Pennsylvania that you basically say like, it we have this much clearance from the from this floor to this floor um and then they make them spin the right way and all that stuff and then they ship it and it came each of these stair treads came separate and then it comes with this giant metal pole right um and then you bend the it's it's it was a pain but i'm glad i did it i learned but a lot, you did so. it you were able to do that and the um the floor in two weeks uh-huh. wow yeah. okay yeah. so had a couple other questions. People are just totally loving this. Okay, so oh boogers. Well, oh bathroom situation. I love that Beth. Man, yeah. this is a friend after my own heart. I have the Everybody's smallest bladder it. ever. Is it downstairs yeah. or upstairs? No, it's upstairs. I'll show you. So that was the other thing is I did. I wanted to make sure that people, if they were here or Casey, um, if you had to Casey go to the bathroom. Casey works for you. Yeah, you want to say hi to Casey? Yeah. Yeah, Casey said, "Oh no." There she is. Um, so yeah, so basically <laughs> Beth's bath- like, yippee, the bathroom. Ooh, that's fancy. With shower. Ooh. So yeah, so this is basically the bathroom. And then, um, and then I did used, oh, let's see if I can turn the light on here. And then I've got, it's kind of a mess right now, but all my camera gear. Nice sliding gets, door. Gets to go back here. I built the door in my shop downstairs. Nice. 
and then yeah i did did some artwork for the walls painted then, uh-huh. or is it wood okay it's wood it's wood painted wood actually and then this is where casey works and this is where that's my desk over there and then um, we also have an outdoor an outdoor working space on the second floor oh nice so on nice days like today we can come out here hang out and you kind of see my neighborhood it's 19, most of this uh, neighborhood was built in like the 20s through the 50s. So kind of a cool neighborhood. That's awesome. But, yeah. Okay. So, so all right. So we have less than 15 minutes left. And uh, yeah. people love your skateboards. They're just loving everything. I love that we got to do a tour, Jeremy. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So you take, so how does that work? So you didn't have Casey at the time? No. No, Casey was a total godsend and is today still a godsend. Okay, so one of the things I want to make sure I cover is there are times when there are down. It, the, the work is not coming in. And yes. you're doing everything. It's long-term relationships. You're building these things. But sometimes it's just um, – and you talked to Alicia Colon on her podcast about this, and yeah. um, which is um, – something i can't think of what the name of it is manual focus manual focus i knew it had an m in it we'll get the it'll be in the show links under there and it really you guys you and your wife really talked about how you uh, she is not she's more anxious and you're more not anxious and but it's kind of like she was like jeremy it's gonna work out it's gonna work out and not yep. necessarily what you would consider from your wife normally right right yeah no it was totally god so what do you do in those times when those happen? I curl up in the fetal position and I rock back and forth. Uh, and I've, and, but I will tell you that. Um, but you're not being like joking. Like you really, it got really. You know, it, oh yeah. It was scary. I mean, uh, you know, my wife is a stay at home mom. She was homeschooling both of our kids uh, at the time. I had a mortgage payment, uh, lost all my benefits. Um, literally, I mean, we, we found out on Friday that the business was closing on Wednesday. So it was like no preparation. And I had a load of job opportunities come up. A lot of people contacted me from other agencies. Um, For full-time gigs, right? Full-time gigs. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and most of them flat out told me we're not hiring, but we want you because I I had a a good reputation in town, you know, and I, um, and I, I, I have a reputation for, you know, someone who's a good team player and, and, um, and so I was grateful for it, but I kind of felt like every time I went in, I figured I'm going to leave all the doors open. I'm going to go in and interview for them and just kind of see, but I felt like there was like a weight on my chest when I would go in and meet with people. And I felt like they were interviewing me, like they were doing me a favor, kind of like, Oh, we're so sorry. You forgot you lost your job. Why don't you come work for us? We'll take care of you sort of thing. And I'm like, I didn't want a job as a favor, you know? Um, and the other thing was, is because our agency was closing, sorry, my dog wants to go out. Okay. Um, since you're standing up, can you show the skateboards? Andre oh, wants yeah, yeah. to see him. <laughs> awesome. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, I lost my train of thought. I know it's well, two ADD people together. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so, um, you didn't want a job because it was a favor. Yeah, no, no, no. And, and. The, the fact was, is the agency was closing uh, and there was opportunity there where I had all these clients uh, and I had their files and I had, I had been working with them for years. So I kind of Jerry Maguire style called all of them and said, Hey, the elements, clo- elements closing. You're not gonna be able to contact me through this anymore, but, but I'm ready to work. I've, I've got, I've, I've got everything we need to do. We'll just, it'll be seamless. And it was, and the best part was, is I actually told them, you keep working with me and I will cut our hourly rate significantly. At the time, I think our agency was like at 125 an hour. And I said, I will work with you at $100 an hour, um, which, which when you're working by yourself and you're working out of your bedroom, that's good, that's good money. <laughs> so, so I basically ended up just kind of seamlessly going from an office space with six people into an annex of my bedroom with our files and continuing to work with the clients I had been working with for the previous 12 years. Um, and that, that was such a blessing for me. Now the first six months or so, none of them had any new projects, which was like 
uh, you know. So um, I ended up doing some freelance work. I worked in-house for uh, a slipper company for a little bit. I ended up doing a bunch of stuff for uh, a shoe company called Superga that was just coming to the United States and did their all their catalogs and their U.S. marketing, uh, stuff like that. And so um, there was some really cool opportunities. And I think God knew that I needed that. Like I needed to kind of work in-house and not feel like for that. I, I needed to heal for a little bit because that was really that was really tough time for me um so all right so all right so for uh, there's like five minutes left and i haven't even covered like all these questions okay we're gonna do the rapid fire and then if we have some extra time we can do the rest or we can do right. a part two okay 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 so um all right so explain to them what you do during the slow times now uh i get my website up to date I will post something on Instagram every once in a while. Uh, I, I think for me, it's mostly like writing that blog post I've been meaning to get to that then gets pushed out on social media. That's how most of my social media stuff is. It's blog posts. Um, and I did a children's book last summer. And so with uh, Beth Stafford, and that's something I'm hoping to do again this summer, but it's so far has been pretty insane. So I don't know. Uh, usually I have a summer slump. Um, it hasn't happened yet, so we'll see what happens, but Beth, Beth and I are, have an understanding about that. So I take on special projects or side projects, um, when I have free time. Okay. So, um, um, oh man, we've have covered some. Okay. So what do you think God is teaching you now? Oh, God is constantly teaching me that I am not the provider and that he is. And I think um, that is one of those things that, that, you know, plagued me for years. And I go in really in depth on that with uh, Alicia's podcast. So if, if you have a chance, take a listen to manual focus. It's really good. Um, but it really, really does. Um, it really, for me, it's like helping me to remind, it's a constant reminder that like, I don't do any self-promotion. I don't send anything out. I don't reach out to anybody. Um, people Google me and word of mouth. I get, I keep, uh, I've been keeping really busy. And so I can't take any credit at all for how busy I've been. Um, so in the same way, I can't take, I can't like fret about it when things go slow either. Like it's just, you know, it's, it's, I have to be willing to work with the ebb and flow. And I've gotten a lot better about that over the years. Well, and so. the other thing you told me was that you had a dad who was. Hold on. Casey's correcting me. Hold on a second. What's that, Casey? That's true. Yeah. So what she said was, is I'm also a self learner. So I use, I use downtime to teach myself new things. So like even with this chin up chinchilla book that I did, um, I made it, I wasn't just going to poop something out. Like I wanted to create something where I was learning new skill sets. So, um, I got on Skillshare. I learned a whole bunch of new techniques. I taught myself how to create custom brushes and illustrator. And now I'm actually like, I've done one workshop. I'm going to start doing more workshops on how to, how to do that as well. So. Okay. That's awesome. Okay. So, um, what do you think? Cause we were talking about this specifically. So what do you think God taught you about being a business owner? um about being a business owner i never wanted to be a business owner i am not super entrepreneurial um i kind of got kicked out of the nest and ended up doing oh, it uh, i know what own. i was gonna ask you it was about your dad that he gave you all these ex i'm sorry no it, go ahead because he gave you a great example of somebody who was hustling right all the time because he was a basketball coach but in the summer yeah. they weren't getting paid so yeah. he had to, so it was kind of like you had this hustle mentality, even though we hate hustling, but it still is part of what we do. So I feel yeah. like it's some is about faith, but it's also about, there has to be skill and there has to be hard work going into that. Yeah. My dad's one of the hardest workers I've ever met. Um, and he was a high school uh, teacher and basketball coach, uh, coached college a little bit growing up. But when we were most of my life, it was in high school. and. Um, so summers he had off and he would mow lawns or paint houses or, you know, do any number of odd jobs in order to make ends meet for our family so we could take a vacation. that year. Uh, and that's one of those things that just really um, resonated with me and I think rubbed off on me a bit. But I'm not, I, 
if if I I think I would have stayed I would have I would have um, retired at Element had it been up to me. Hmm. Okay. So, um, when do you think you started thinking of yourself as an entrepreneur? If since you didn't really want to do the business side. I don't know if I think about my, I honestly don't still don't think of myself as really an entrepreneur. I just, I like working with entrepreneurs. That's really exciting for me. <laughs> um, that's like, well, Jeremy, you're an entrepreneur. I'm so sorry to I let know. you know. I'm you can go in the mirror. I yeah. am an entrepreneur. I yeah, am I'm a reluctant, <laughs> reluctant entrepreneur. Um, but, um, yeah. All right. So these are our rapid fire questions. Yes. How do you oh, recharge? Yeah. Uh, I do not work after five or five thirty ever, and I do not work weekends. And um, I spend time with my wife and my kids as much as I can. Okay, and then what inspires you? Oh man, how do you answer that? There's just two. I don't know well, if what's I can inspired you today. What has inspired me today? I will say creation, and I know this is a really sounds like a really stupid and generic answer. Maybe I don't know, but I, I, the the fact that everything around me is created um, just blows me away. Like just the, the intricacies of every detail, the fact that a leaf, you know, sucks in the sunlight and creates nutrients for a tree, just blows my mind. And we take it for granted all the time, but I think just you know how a a bird builds a nest or a whatever i just that's just just the the detail to which god planned and created our environment and our world just completely inspires me okay that's a great answer all right so what advice would you give your younger self or maybe like fred um when i was in high school uh life is better when you get out of high school amen um i i the john mayer song i know i i'm a john mayer nerd i love john mayer but he's got that, you know, I'm going to run through the halls in my high school. I'm going to scream at the top of my lungs. There's no such thing as the real world. Uh, this, you know, there's this, this thing growing up that it's like, you know, when you get out in the real world, you know, all the time. Uh, and I, I've never found the real world to be all that daunting. Uh, and it's been way better than high school or middle school, especially middle school. Middle school is like the worst years of my life. Oh, I just, we didn't have middle school. We went from kindergarten through seventh grade was one school and then eighth grade through 12th grade talk about hell anyway yeah. uh let's we've talked enough about high school uh but so uh patricia has two 17 year old twins she's like double amen to that so doc yeah. has does turning the work off at 5 p.m and no weekends does that include learning or do you have learning time scheduled into the work day and i have another question about that i have learning time scheduled into the work day i my kids, like because we homeschooled and I'm working from home, I would be sitting here and at 5.15, I get this, like, mm. dad, it's after five. And I was like, okay, walk on pen down. I'm heading downstairs. Um, and so that's just how it's been. I very, very rarely, I would say in a year, there may be two or three evenings that I will work late. Because if I don't, I will, I will end up staying up all night because I'm so stressed out about deadlines. Right. And my wife would be like, I'm taking the kids out, just get some work done. But literally, maybe twice a year, I'll do something so, like that. But learning wise, is that, is that the same sort of thing? Or, or you're like, I are you drawing after or no? No. Well, I draw with my kids. Both my kids are super creative. We bought a laser cutter this year. So like, I spend a lot of time creating stuff with my kids. We have, I have a wood shop. That was the other thing I was getting around to. The reason we got the split, the mini splits is because we didn't have to put a conventional furnace in the basement, which means I could do a wood shop and not have to worry about dust getting into it and going all over the house. So um, I have a full wood shop in the basement um, and a laser cutter and all that stuff. So my kids, we spend a ton of time down there making like the, the costumes that I, that I wore to Creative South we made in my shop. Okay, so one of the things, so Doc's like, I'm really impressed at how productive you are during the week. One of the things I think, and we talked about this last time, and I think Casey chimed in on this one too, is that you make decisions really quick. You're not hemming and hawing, and I think that this can be 
um, maybe related back to that sign shop or that first, the t-shirt shop, because you didn't have time. You just had to crank things out and you have to decide and then move on, decide and, you know, and, and it's not a forever piece sometimes. So how, how do you think for somebody who maybe does hem and haw and push pixel and this there and try this color, how, what's a technique you've been able to use or is this just how you were built? I just, I don't know. I am very proactive and I don't, I'm not a noodler. I know when something's done and I can move on. And that's just something that I've been, and I know that it's possible that if I would spend another four hours on it, I might make it a little bit better. But at some point in time when part of your job is invoicing and writing contracts and proposals and like all the other things that have to happen with having a small business, um, you just have to prioritize some things. It's like I could spend another full day noodling with this, and it's, but it's good. Like it's good as it is. It's good. Um, sometimes I think, uh, you know, I look back and I go, man, I, I probably should have spent more time on that. Um, but you have to learn when, like if, if, if you don't send invoices out, you never get paid. So there's no point in spending the eight hours when you should be sending out invoices, noodling with something, or you're never going to get a check. Right. So, you know, I, I was thinking about this. I was actually thinking about writing a blog post. I started it this morning, but this concept, you hear people say it all the time. I'll have to make time to do something. And it's just so many things in the world we can make. We can make bread and we can make, you know, stuff, but we can't make time. Time is the only thing we can't make. Mm -hmm. So, so you can't make time. You have to prioritize. You have to take if you, if you do something, you are, have to, by necessity, take that time from something else and say no to things. And I think for me, one of the biggest things has been learning what to say no to is mm -hmm. way more important oftentimes than what to say yes to. To me, Jeremy, this is something I would take a class from you about because I would love to learn more about that knowing what to say no to. I think this is the inner entrepreneur. I know you say you're reluctant, but this, that is, that is, that is the brain of an entrepreneur, not necessarily the brain of a designer because we do noodle and we just get, and we want to blah, blah, blah. And it's like, but this isn't worth it. It's not worth, you can't bill all your is your time is going down. And so it's like that you're able to see that and instead of having somebody tell you, hey, you got to cut that off. Like I can do it with anybody who's working for me. I'm like, no, no, I can only pay for two hours. You get whatever you can done in two hours. And then, right. you know, that that's what it is. I'm not, I, I can't spend 11 hours on a, you know, a, a doggy daycare, Father's Day certificate which that's right, one right. thing I did one time. I mean, I didn't, but an intern spent that much time. Yeah. So, so to me, I, I, I don't know how you've been able to do that, but I would love, I think this is not a blog post. I think this is an ebook or a book. Cause I would love to know how, cause I think you've probably done it innately for so many years. Um, yeah. but I'd love to kind of you analyze that because I do think it's figuring out how much time in the day you're going to spend to this or, and Amy yeah. agrees an ebook is a great idea. Oh, I'll just add that to my list. <laughs> In your downtime. Right, All right. right. Exactly. So, so the last question, we did pretty good. We just get didn't we didn't get one. Um, what is next? What's next for me? Yes, because you're the guest on episode three hundred. It's oh, Jerry Slagle. It's all about you. <laughs> what? Mind blown. No, I more of what I'm doing. I am, you know, we were just talking about like, you know, what are some projects I would love to, I would love to do a project for Starbucks. I would love to do, I got a chance to do, I will tell you that this year, and I am not legally allowed to say who it was for. I got to do the most amazing project with the most amazing client. I thought I would, I've never thought in a million years I would ever get a chance to work with them, much less fly to Europe to work in-house to work with them on it. Um, I mean, m mind absolutely blown. It doesn't get any better than that. And so I'm kind of like, I don't know. I don't have real, I don't set lofty goals and stuff like that. I just love to do what I'm doing. And I'm just, you know, more of what I'm doing. And like I said, I don't actively go out to find work that much. Um, it usually comes in more, more than I can handle. So, um, yeah. 
it's hard for me to say what my goals are. It's really, God has been my project manager and my new business development guy, and he's done a great job so far and will continue to do so. Um, but, and that but, one. So, so put that in somebody else who also is, has a great relationship with God, but it is not coming. So, so painting that side, it's like, Oh, I'm not a good enough Christian or something. You know what I mean? So it's clearly. So <laughs> That was my problem. All right, people. Time's out. I got to. Yeah, you're not spiritual <laughs> enough. I don't know what the problem is. Okay. So, um, but. That's not true. <laughs> but so, so what, so what would you say? Cause so there is a faith component, right? Um, for you. Absolutely. So, but what, what yeah. would you say to somebody else? Cause I don't think it has to do with being, um, you know, like everything's in order. Like, I, I mean, I, I think anyway. I'm not bragging about the fact that I don't have to find work because if the stuff slowed down, I would totally go out to look for work. My problem is I don't have time to do it because I have so much work coming in. Um, it's just a good problem to have. Sometimes I feel like, man, I would love to create a self-promotional and I've done it. Like in my spare time, I've kind of gotten ideas for self-promotional pieces, but I never get around to actually sending them out because I just, I can't get to it because paying work is coming first. Right. So. Um, I'm, I, I uh, have been doing this for 10 years. This November will be my 10 year anniversary. Um, and I, I am not, I'm not discounting the fact that that may happen. I mean, it, it could overnight, things could completely dry up and then I need to start hustling and I need to get stuff out in front of people and it might motivate me to get my website up to date or, or whatever. One of the things I think is neat about the stuff you do, um, and this, so if, if I'm trying to re reverse engineer how Jeremy's doing this, why is he not having to find, I do think that you have connections within the industry. You are a good team player, but you have a variety um, in the type of work that you, now you're doing a ton of branding, but you're not like just branding um, hospitals, you know, it's like you right. have something that some, so, some stuff's kind of techy and then some stuff's real hand illustrated. There's a lot of life to this stuff that you're, you're coming at. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. you have to start these conversations and maybe it's that because you started so early, you've talked to a lot of people in a lot of many years and these people are, con and you're not just a hermit in in columbus you go out and you do things right mm -hmm. yeah i think that yeah. those things add up it's being present and being part of the community of design with um with prayer for designers or with creative south or with the people in columbus i think that if if that's where i feel like some people if you are in a in a hole um, I'm going to just call out Beth. Look at this super cute little illustration. And it's so That's adorable. Soft. She's in Kansas. Beth Snyder. Oh Beth.snyder.art. So S-N-I-D-E-R dot art. Anyway. Well, done. I know. And look how cute it is. I was like, oh, look. She's like, it's upside down. Look how cute this is. Isn't that anyway? She has a children's book, a couple children's books actually. That's awesome. And so, and I met her through YouTube. She's and now we're friends, uh, and I have her phone number. But anyway, so um, I know Derek's totally like she has these. I think for sale. You could go to BethSnyderArt.com probably, but maybe she can put her thing in her, huh, in her thing. Oh man. <laughs> Okay. Um, my clients like texting me like, what kind of response did you get? And I'm like, Oh, I have one time. Um, okay. So, but so Beth, I don't know, but I don't know what Beth's been doing. Right. She, um, I mean, not that like, that's like, I don't know what Beth's been doing. Not that that's not okay. But what I mean is, you know, she has a specific audience she's doing, but you know, is is reaching out is the town she's in she's in leavenworth kansas if anybody cares um but you know is that that might not be this amazing town for uh illustrators you know so then what can she do to get her name out and i think sometimes it's like if i want to do more web design i need to partner with coders because they don't they're not doing it so where right. could she go I mean, I'm not saying in specific, I mean, you could give it, but you know what I mean? I think that you're having conversations with companies, not just other designers. So you have a presence in the design community, but you also maybe have, or maybe not. 
I might get referrals from other designers, but I don't do much work with other agencies at all. Right. Um, but all, you know designers my- through uh, the community with, that's how I know you through Creative South. Yes. But so you know other people in your community or in the world that are not other designers that, you know, I feel like sometimes we're like, Oh, Hey, we're just all friends us. And then, but we're all trying to do similar kinds of work and we can only, but we need to step out, like go to the coding conference or something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, find your community outside of work. You know, I'm really involved in my church. I ride a vintage Vespa scooter. So I'm involved with the local scooter club. Talk about nerds. We're, we're there. Um, I'm involved in, in other ways at my gym, you know, I've got a a community there. So I think it's really important, obviously, to get outside of, you know, I remember for years, it was, you know, oh, I do work with this guy, because we're both part of the same country club. You know, I've never been a country club kind of guy. But one of my old bosses got all his work through people that he golfed with. Because people do business with people they like, know and trust. That's so right. You got to get out. I'm not saying just Beth. I mean, I love you, Beth. Hopefully you know that I'm not thrown under the bus. I no, think no. for anybody, I think this is a problem overall. And I feel like then we feel like it's just us. Nobody wants to hire me. And I think the, one of the best things I can do is talk to other people. You know, anyway, it's a whole nother conversation, but yeah. all right, let me share some of your links, Jeremy. Okay, right. go for it. All yeah. right, so you can go to Slagle Design. Okay, there's he also does a podcast, the Joy Venture Podcast. It's kind of randomly put out. Do you want to tell him about it? Yeah, uh, so one of my best friends on the planet, his name is Thad DeBassi. He and I meet on Wednesday mornings with a group of other guys. Dylan Mengus is one of them, uh, a couple other guys, and we get together and we do like a prayer meeting sort of thing, a bunch of creative entrepreneurs. Um, Thad and I do a podcast where we just interview people that, that are doing their job, doing a job or, or have a career based on the fact that they just found joy in something that was completely unexpected. Hmm. Um, and so like the, if you want to know more about John's organization called Asia's hope that has the, the homes in Cambodia, the, he's one of the interviewees on there and it's worth listening to. It's a great story. Um, we've got a woman named Brittany Baum, who's one of my clients who, uh, worked for, uh, um, uh, an engineering company in the United States would go to, uh, Germany on, on, on work and she's a vegan. So she started eating uh, Bavarian pretzels in Germany, got to know the family, came back here, started sharing the recipe. And now she has multiple pretzel shops in Columbus. And she, so Like it's stuff where people, they don't have any formal training in it. They just fell in love with something and they got a lot of joy from it and it ended up becoming what, what they do for a living. And so it's just lots of stories, uh, people through trial and whatever they've had to go through to get to where they are. It's, and so those are the kind of the the people it's very sporadic. It is, we haven't released anything in the last six months. Uh, we're, we've ju- we've done two recent recordings, um, um, but we're it's sporadic. It's we're never going to make a million dollars do it or have thousands of followers. It's just something we do for fun. And then you and Beth Stafford did the chin up chinchilla, but you also created, yes. or she created. I don't know who created you. Ben and Beth created the Happy Cargo books. Are you part of that, or are you just? Yeah. Okay. Ha- uh, yes. <laughs> Happy Cargo books. Happy Cargo Books is yes. is basically we didn't want to have chinupchinchilla.com because we knew there were two more books after that. Um, so we came up with a fake publishing company and um, uh, and came up with Happy Cargo Books. And you did it as a Skillshare. I mean, as a Kickstarter Skillshare. Kickstarter. Yep. yep. Okay. We got funded in five days. It was awesome. It was, but you could teach people how to get funded because you really did a ton of pre work ton of pre-work Beth, Beth okay did Beth a did a ton of pre-work oh my so, gosh she killed it and she was exhausted it was like we ran a marathon at the end of that that was way more work than we thought it was going to be but my book was awesome I loved it I still I mean you. I don't even have kids and I bought it okay so I just want to tell you thank you thank you for coming and thank you everybody who came for number 300 so my Yay. mom my mom yesterday, she's still here, so I, she's probably listening. So she, I taught her how to do the chat, but I don't think she did. Anyway, um, 
she's doing it. But she was like, I told you once a week was too much. And I was like, it is a lot. But I do take off December, most of December, three weeks in December, which really does help. And then I've tried in weeks where there were five, if you've noticed, I try to take off one of those days. And it really has helped. And I've um, in July, I had not scheduled any um uh, con- any interviews. And so I think I'm going to take July 4th off or July 3rd is a Wednesday. So I'm going to take that day off and then I'm going to do another three part series and it's going to be leading up to the power station and the launching of this coaching group that I'm doing. So, um, I am excited. We're in the coach in the beta group. Um, it's eight people, seven people. I'm terrible with math. Um, and, and me and you in algebra, right? Anyway, yes. <laughs> Jeremy's like, I'm back to the chat. I'm reading, Diane. I'm not paying attention. Anyway, um, I just appreciate you guys. You have no idea. This is uh, my design recharge has changed my life, but not me doing it's me meeting a whole bunch of people. But I could have done this on my own. Like I could have done this, just met people. I could have recorded it on my own. But to me, it's about bringing it and doing this together. So if you didn't know, I know I don't say this enough, but you can come live here at the end. I'm telling you clearly all you people are here, but look at, let me just tell you what happened. So I'm like, Beth, put your handle in there. She didn't, but you know who did Taylor Ackerman volunteer of the year. But if somebody doesn't, somebody else does because we're a family. And I just think, look, I get to spend an hour or an hour and a half sometimes with you every, or, you know, however long I go. Not sometimes, but probably most of the time. Anyway, you know what I mean. But I'm just very thankful because this is so much to me that it's you're able to come and join live. And I just really, it means the world to me that you spend time with me. So thank you. Oh, that's just the sweetest thing. <laughs> I'm teary. Right. Do you need a tissue? I have really soft tissues. Or I have a pillow. Aw. And I can't remember what this, what this pillow, this guy's, or is a girl. I can't remember. What's its name? Hilda. Her name's, she didn't, Beth did not name it, but she's okay with the name. Love it. (laughs) Okay. Um, Guys, you can always follow me at Design Recharge on everywhere. And I am better than Jeremy on Instagram. Not that I'm better. My work's not better. No, you are. But um, (laughs) I am, I'm more there. But I did have a problem, Jeremy. I just wanted to apologize. I was, I, um, something was wrong. My Instagram would not post like your images. So then I had to do like some back anyway, I think something's wrong My with broke the Instagram. <laughs> no, because then I just took a screenshot and I cropped it and it would work. So it was fine. So it, it's, you know, we're just working out some of these things, but I just wanted you to know that's why I didn't post till late because I was trying to fix that. And anyway, sorry. It's fine. We're good. <laughs> I'm glad yeah. Michael. Thank you. Sorry, he said a highlight to his week. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dee. I really, really, really appreciate it. Oh, and you can always support the show. Dee's a new patron um, for a dollar or five dollars. That super, super helps. And I'm super thankful. And my friend Will Truen, he's the one who pushed me for two years to get on there. So I really appreciate it. And Beth's a new one. And we're doing a, um, a drink challenge. Brian White finished he decided not to do 30 days he's like i'll do this but i'm not doing 30 days he did 14 days and his 14th day was today amy's doing it a whole bunch of people are doing it and i'm it's really fun so anyway do you have anything else to say jeremy i don't that was fun (laughs) it was fun all right let me hit stop and we'll see you guys. You can always hit like and you can um, give a review on iTunes. That would be helpful or Spotify or wherever you get your podcast or Google Play or whatever. Um, and that's it. And we'll see you for episode 301. This is starting the Illustrator series. And Sean Ferguson is next week. And he, like, I love this. And he, you know, he's an illustrator, but he is, that's just one tool in his tool belt, people. And what's got him success is doing other things as well. He's also a photographer like you, Jeremy, and he is a killer photographer. And he's just, anyway, I can't wait to, for you guys. If you don't know who he is, I can't wait to introduce him. And if you do know, he's so smart. I can't wait to have him on next. And super nice. I've, you know, decided that I only have nice people as friends. And I'm very thankful. Anyway. All right. 
hit like. Bye. Hey, I just wanted to tell you about a couple of ways you can support the channel, the show, and the podcast. One, you can get extra content delivered to you to patrons only by going to patreon.com slash Diane Gibbs. And then my favorite way to build websites has changed a little bit recently. Um, I am now using the Elementor plugin with the Divi theme. The Elementor plugin works with almost any theme. It makes almost any theme invincible. This plugin has changed the way that I've been able to design websites. It was allowing me to work at such a faster speed where other plugins fell short. Now I don't need that. I just need Elementor. You go to bit.ly, B-I-T L-Y, slash dr elementor my favorite theme of course which i've told you about before is the divi theme it gives you complete control i purchased the lifetime plan which was 250 dollars. i believe that's the same price it is now and you can for the lifetime you never have to pay a renewal fee every year which it's about I think $80. It is a based off of a grid system. And now I need one theme and I can do custom sites. And it allows me to use strategy and customize for their needs instead of trying to adjust a theme that already exists. And the last thing that I love that I use every day is Audible. Audible has changed my business and has changed my life. I listen to more books than I physically read nowadays. I listen when I work out when I mow, when I have a long commute. These are all affiliate links. That means if you click on the link and purchase an item, I will receive an affiliate commission. So that's it. Those are ways to support the show. Thanks.